Grace and peace, friends. Welcome back to United We Pray, joined again by Shai Lin. How you doing, Shai? I'm doing well, man. It's, it's good to be here. It's good to be here. Uh, listeners, we were just at an in-person event together in Washington State, and it was so good to see you in person, brother. Yeah, man. It was it was a blessing to to be there and to partner with United We Pray. We loved having you. As has already happened once in this series together, we were you and I were having a conversation, recording an episode, and realized that a side trail that we weren't able to indulge deserved its own episode. So that's the episode we're going to record today. Uh, the conversation was we were talking about ethnic sin, and really this came about that United We Pray has a working definition for racism, which is just ethnic partiality. You had some pushback, not so much pushback, but reminded me of a section that you did in New Reformation, where you outlined several different ethnic sins. And while we are sort of using ethnic partiality as an all-encompassing term, yours gets much more specific. And so I wanted to go through those and discuss them. But before we do that, um, since we're talking about sin, what is sin? The, the Bible, 1 John 3, 4, defines sin or describes sin as lawlessness. Um, so sin is directly connected with the, the law of God, either the explicit law that's been, been given in Scripture as outlined in the Ten Commandments, or the law of God that in Romans 2 is described as, as being written on the human heart. So sin is is breaking the law of God. I like that definition. I mean, straight out of the Bible, but there's an important element to highlight there, which is I think our conception of sin is oftentimes too small. I think we think of sin as sort of a knowing, conscious, high-handed decision to break a rule we knew about. And the Bible's definition is based on God's unchanging law, whether we know we're doing it or not. Right. Yeah. There's a category for, for unintentional sins. So in, in Leviticus, there's, a, there's actually a sacrifice that is made specifically for unintentional sins. So the fact that we were unaware does not exempt us from the consequences of, you know, of breaking God's law. It doesn't exempt us from his, his standard remains his standard, regardless of our relationship to it. Right. And in the context of ethnic sins, when it takes someone pointing out a blind spot that can be kind of a tender feeling because it, it makes you realize, oh, there's there's this whole other category of an area where I've been disobedient. Absolutely. A hundred percent. Yeah. Okay. So let's keep all of that in mind as we look through the different ethnic sins you outlined here. And the first one is probably the clearest and easiest one to think about, which is ethnic hatred. Yeah. Ethnic hatred. Um, so th this, this is usually what people mean when they say racism. They're, they're usually talking about uh, this kind of conscious a animosity towards a person or a group of people based on their their ethnicity. Um, and so, so one of the things I do in the book is for, for each one of the categories, I give uh, a biblical example and, and a modern example for each. Um, and so for for ethnic hatred, the the modern example of that would be the KKK um, or neo Nazis, right? Uh, people who are kind of kind of known for explicit hostile animosity towards people on the basis of their ethnicity, and that that an animosity often leads to to violence against against those people. Um, and then, as far as a, a biblical example is concerned, I give the example from, from Esther chapter nine of, of Haman. Uh, Haman is described as an enemy of the Jews. And, and it says in Esther nine that he, he actually plotted against the Jews in order to, to destroy them. So, so that was that plotting against the Jews on the part of Haman was, uh, a manifestation of, of ethnic hatred. And I said, this is the clearest example. And I chose clearest over easiest because this is, this is in many cases, the most hurtful example. Um, but it's the, mm. it's the one most simple to understand. Right. Yeah. And, and, and usually, I mean, this, this is, it's pretty uncontroversial, this one, right. Um, you know, in terms of, you know, m 
regardless of where you are on the spectrum, people will recognize that this is this is a real thing that that people hold hostility against others because of their ethnicity. And just sidebar for a second, one of the reasons this was such a helpful section of the book is because people call so many different things racism. But when ethnic hatred is what we have in mind, then it's, whoa, 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 whoa. I could be doing one of these many other things, and people might even fairly be calling it racism, but it's much more precise to use these other terms and and get at what can sometimes be confusing when it's all lumped in the same category. Right, exactly. Because And one of the things that I say is that, you know, that category of racism, it it says too much and not enough at the same time, right? So, so there's, there's a broad spectrum, a broad umbrella um, that people m- mean, or like, yeah, there's a there's, there's a wide range of things that people could mean when they say racism, um, and um, and if we're not careful, you know, so so anything from you know prejudice. Um, you know, uh, attitudes towards towards people of different ethnicity, negative attitudes. Um, you know, if you have that on one side, so just kind of a, a silent, um, not even full on animosity, but just a, just kind of a, a silent either resentment or dislike or whatever the case may be for another ethnicity. You may have that. And then on the other extreme, you have someone you know, in Buffalo pulling out uh, an AK and just shooting up, a, you know, a store in a black neighborhood. Well, there's a wide range between those two things, right? And if both of those things are labeled with the same term, it's only going to introduce confusion. Yeah, I think you're spot on. And it's one of the things we appreciate you. One of the reasons we wanted to have you on is that clear defining work that just cuts through the nonsense and misunderstanding. Okay, so we've got ethnic hatred. Mm. Next, you have ethnic pride. Yeah, ethnic pride. So that's that's going to be much more subtle. Um, and ethnic pride, I define as a person having feelings of superiority concerning the ethnic group that they belong to. Um, and a lot of times, that comes along with looking at other ethnic groups at, at ethnic groups as inferior. Um, one one modern example I gave of this would be the Black Hebrew Israelites. Um, so the Black Hebrew Israelites is a um, is a group of mo- most mostly men. Uh, you find them in most major cities in in America, um, and they basically teach that um, that Africans are the are actually is actually Israel, uh, and that uh, that Europeans are are the real Gentiles, um, and um, and they basically when you boil it down it's it's black people are really god's chosen people um and and if you dive deeply into their rhetoric um it's 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 ethnic pride it's a form of ethnic pride it's it's seeking to find find dignity um by exalting one ethnicity over over others um and then i I give an example in the bible of goliath uh concerning israel so in uh, 1 Samuel 17, uh, verse 8, it says that Goliath, it says he stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, why have you come out to draw up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? <laughs> and are you not servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. So you hear that, you know, he, I'm a Philistine, right? He's, he's, he's taking, taking pride in that, um, how, like, how dare you come to battle me? Like you're like, you're a servant of Saul. I'm a Philistine. Um, and that that's, that's ethnic pride. And, and we know how that ended for Goliath. Not well. You mentioned how, uh, the black Hebrew Israelites are attempting to sort of confer or elevate their own dignity at the expense of others. And I think this could be a helpful, uh, question for some of our white listeners, because when you have an ethnicity that has been historically denigrated or had their dignity called into question or removed, then there needs to be a concerted effort to re-elevate that dignity to where it needs to be, which is equal with other Mm -hmm. ethnicities. But sometimes we can see that attempt to elevate someone who's been oppressed and see that as a form of ethnic pride in and of itself. 
So is there, help us understand the difference between trying to uh, affirm the dignity of someone specific who may have suffered some kind of ethnic oppression in the past and differentiating that from sinful ethnic pride. The key is to see things in line with scripture and and what God says about us, how he describes us. Um, and and really the, the call for dignity amongst those who have historically been denigrated is not to elevate themselves above others, but to actually bring themselves up to where scripture places them. Right. Um, and, and then that, that's going to go all the way back to, uh, the, you know, the, the one being made in the image of God, right? So from the very beginning, all human beings, um, are made in God's image. And, and in that, in itself, there, there's a, there's an inherent dignity, there's an inherent value that we all have as, as image bearers. And then it goes back to things that we, that we dis we've discussed, um, which, which is the God's plan for a diverse group of people from every tribe, language, people, and nation united under the banner of Jesus Christ and him crucified. And when Jesus, uh, died on the cross, uh, when, when, um, when he laid down his life, he was very intentional about doing so for a multi-ethnic group of people. And that in itself gives dignity to all ethnicities. Um, and so, um, yeah, I, th I think it's very important to not miscategorize, um, the, the attempts of, of those who have historically been denigrated to, to miscategorize that as ethnic pride providing when in those attempts, it's not seeking to denigrate some, another ethnicity, which is our sinful tendency. Right. I, I, I hear you. And the caution is, is right. I think we can sometimes read that sinful pride onto situations where it might not be there because if we assume right. we're advocating for a specific the dignity of a specific ethnicity we must be doing it at the expense of others which is just simply not the case absolutely not the case um and and, and one of the other points that I, that I make in the book is that is that like ethnic like when it comes to ethnicity like we're, we're not called to boast in it we're not we're not called to be ashamed of it um, we're called, we're called to actually celebrate not only our own ethnicity, but other ethnicities. And, um, because, because each ethnicity, each ethnicity is, uh, a specific, uh, pathway to understanding the, the glory of Christ and his beauty and in his, in his creativity. Um, and so, you know, I would never look at, uh, you know, a St. Patrick's Day parade, for example, <laughs> and say, oh, what are they doing? You know, they, that, that is a bunch of ethnic pride. They were wearing all that green. It's just like, now, you know, besides all the other, act, you know, activities and imbibing and, and beverages and all that kind of stuff, that, that's a whole other thing. But but the actual, like, the actual parade and, and like, celebration of Irish culture, like, like that's dope. And that, that's something that, I, like, I want to learn from that. You know what I'm saying? And and in Christ, uh, specifically within the context of the church, it's a beautiful thing when brothers and sisters from different ethnicities are able to come together and 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 learn about different backgrounds and and cultures and foods and you know, like all those kinds of things. Like it's 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 a beautiful thing. So that like that's meant to be celebrated so that God might get the glory in His uh, design for, for create and, and creativity, his creative genius and make and making people different. Amen to all of that. Okay. Next one is ethnic partiality. Yeah. Partiality or favoritism, right? So that, that's the, that, that's the practice of giving unjust preferential treatment to a person or a group on the basis of their ethnicity. Um, so 
a modern example that I give is Wells Fargo. So Wells Fargo in 2020, there was a lawsuit that they settled for $8 million. Uh, they were charged by the U.S. Department of Labor of discriminatory hiring practices. Um, so, so basically, they were they were hiring in such a way that they were um, uh, overlooking qualified black applicants, um, and they ended up settling the case, um, and they ended up providing jobs to to a number of the applicants that were affected by that. And so, so that that was uh, a, the charge was ethnic favoritism. Um, another modern example would be in, in the NFL, right? So Na national football league, there, there's, there's the, uh, one, one coach, uh, actually filed a lawsuit against the NFL saying that minority coaches were being overlooked in favor of, of white coaches. Um, and so, um, that charge is, is ethnic favoritism. Um, another example I give modern example is, is affirmative action, right? Affirmative action. Like when people are bothered by affirmative action, it's because they believe that those companies and institutions, I guess b before it was outlawed, <laughs> uh, they believe that those companies and institutions were, were, were practicing ethnic favoritism. Um, and then in the Bible, I give, I give two examples, one being in James chapter two, verse nine. So it says, if you show favoritism or partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. So I'm basically just combining that, that, um, the sin in James of, of partiality or favoritism and just putting it in the realm of, of ethnicity. Um, and then the second example is Galatians two, which we've talked about. Uh, where Peter eats with the, gen uh, the the Jewish Christians rather than the Gentile ones. Um, that was ethnic favoritism, and, and Paul rebukes that strongly. Yes, and we see this as like a gospel issue, and one of the first issues that the church deals with is this ethnic partiality, which you reminded us uh, a few episodes ago should give us hope because God's already given us the tools to deal with this. 100%, 100%. And, and it, it's, it's something that, you know... I, um, I was having a conversation recently with, with some brothers at church and it, there was a brother, uh, from the Philippines, uh, who's, uh, he's going, uh, him, him and his family going back to the Philippines to do some, some, some mission pastoral work. Um, the issue as we see it in America, like we don't have the same issue in the same way and it like. Like the whole black white thing in America is just like crazy, um, which which I agree, and because there's historical factors that play into that, in, including the relationship between the church, like how like how the how the church has been complicit in 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 these areas. Um, but I was I was I was trying to remind him that like these things are universal. So this is this is not just an America thing. Like if you if you dig into any culture. Like we are experts when it comes to identifying differences between us and then like denigrating people because of those differences that we've identified. Like that's, that's, that's a human nature thing. And like, all you have to do is go to any schoolyard and just like, just sit down on the playground and just watch kids as they interact with each other. And you're going to see that, that kind of thing happen. Um, and so. So ab absolutely, God has given us the tools to address these things because it's because of the nature of the fall, our fallenness, sin. This is just something that we're going to have to deal with. And so we need to try to deal with it as biblically as possible. The next one you have is ethnic oppression. Yeah, ethnic oppression. So the definition of oppression is the unjust or cruel exercise of power or authority towards a person. That's what oppression is. And then I just included eth ethnicity in that. So it's ethnic, ethnic oppression would be that same unjust or, or cruel exercise of power toward a person or people, but make it, but it's on the basis of their ethnicity. That, that, that's the, that's the impetus. That's what's driving the, uh, the oppression. Um, and so I gave a couple of examples. So one, 
modern example would be the, the displacement of Native Americans in the U.S. And so if you if you just take a cursory glance at the history of, of how that has like how reservations came to be, you'll see that it's steeped in ethnic oppression. Um, another example I give is uh, we, we've talked about on the on the book episode of Bill Stunt's um, The Collapse of American Criminal Justice. Uh, he, he talks about the war on drugs in the 80s and 90s, and he describes that as a form of de facto ethnic oppression towards African-Americans. So I'm actually going to read a quote from that book, and I think it's really helpful. Uh, he says, he says, as the generation long battle against urban prostitution and corner saloons disproportionately targeted immigrant communities in the early 1900s. The generation-long drug war that began in the 1970s disproportionately targeted Black communities. The peak of that discriminatory drug war came in 1986 with the passage of federal legislation that punished possession of one gram of crack as much as possession of 100 grams of cocaine powder. Most cocaine powder uh, defendants were white. Blacks were a minority of crack users but the overwhelming majority of crack defendants, uh, end quote. And so, so that that's uh, what the what what Stunts is arguing there is that like that that disparity in in ch both charging and sentence ten sentencing was in essence a form of ethnic oppression, and and we and we see the effects of it in in and still are seeing the effects of it in mass mass incarceration and that kind of thing. Um, in the Bible, oh, did you want to comment on that or? No, go ahead. Um, and then in the Bible, uh, ethnic oppression, one one example, there are many, but one is, one clear one is the, the oppression of the Hebrews by the Egyptians, right? So in Exodus 3, verse 9, God says to Moses, and now behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I've also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Um, and sometimes things can be like in plain sight, right before our eyes. We'll, we'll, we've read it many, many times, but just haven't seen it through a particular lens. But what was going on between the Egyptians and Israel was 100% ethnic oppression. Like you, you had two people groups, one and one people group dominating the other because they don't belong to the same, they're not of the same nation, they're not of the same same culture, et cetera. And so that that's that's another example of that. Yeah, it really is all over the Old Testament, especially, but even in the New Testament, and you know, the Roman oppression of the of the Jews. One hundred percent. Like it's 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 literally right there. Next one you have is ethnic idolatry. Ethnic idolatry. So this this is a a, a sin of the heart. So it's 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 elevating one's own ethnicity to a place that causes that person to break the law of God. So the modern example I give is Christian parents who forbid their Christian child to marry another Christian <laughs> because of their ethnicity. Um, that, that violates the law of God. Uh, the Bible is very clear that when it comes to marriage, as long as it's lawful, there are no ethnic restrictions. So yeah. The only consideration in God's view is, is the other person a Christian? Is the other person in the Lord, as it says in 1 Corinthians 7, verse 39? Um, and yeah, so so it's, yeah, it's, it's elevating your ethnicity to a point where it causes you to break God's law. Um, the, the biblical example I give is, uh, is Miriam and Aaron in the book of Numbers where they criticize Moses for marrying a Cushite woman. Uh, so in, in Numbers 12, verse 8, it says, Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Cushite woman whom he had married, for he had married a Cushite woman. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against them. And it, I, it always stands out to me, that repetition of that phrase. He married a Cushite woman and... Because he had married a Cushite woman, right? And they were angry at him because of the Cushite woman. Like it's like he that repetition is highlighting the fact that she was a different ethnicity. Miriam and Aaron, they weren't feeling it, and they had they had beef with Moses because of it. And it says that God had beef with them 
because of their beef they had with Moses because of that. Yeah, whose side does God take? And that one is particularly enlightening, I think, because um, we see prohibitions against marrying into the nations in the Old Testament, but the rationale given is because they will draw you away from following the Lord. But if there was someone of another ethnicity who was following Yahweh, marry them. We have examples of that commended in the example of Ruth. And I think the example of Zipporah mm. too, in relationship with Moses, because she's the covenant keeper uh, who saves mm -hmm. behind when uh, he hadn't circumcised his son. Yeah. And then, and that, that's just a wild passage. <laughs> Everything that's happening there. But <laughs> yeah. A hundred percent, bro. Yes. Like, and, and, and again, I, I think it's our fallen human nature. I can see how Israel messed up and thought that it was their Israeliteness that gave them favor with God. I, even though God said it over and over again, it's not. Like, it's not because of your righteousness that I'm doing these things. He said it over and over again, but our pride and our, because, because what Israel has seen is like, they've been set apart. They've clearly been like, they have the true God. The other nations don't have the true God. And like, they have God's laws. Like he's done this for no other nation. Praise the Lord. It says in the Psalms, right? And so you just see, and you really see it moving into the new Testament where they get to a point where they just, they just kind of feel in themselves. Like, like we like they're they're the dogs out there, right? We like we're the Israelites, you know. Um, and so, um, yeah. But but it, you're absolutely right. It it was never it was never on anything that was inherent within them. It was just simply the fact that God had chose them and and set them apart. The issue of interracial marriage it seems like it's coming up more recently than in years past. It's interesting. We we got a new website, did a bunch of SEO stuff. Nobody cares about that, but. Uh, our most popular article this year is something I wrote a couple of years ago on interracial marriage. People are looking huh. for that term and finding it and coming to our website. Interesting. We haven't posted it. We haven't promoted it. Like we're out here promoting other stuff and that piece is outperforming anything else we've done because people are looking for it. Wow. Wow. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it's. Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> that that would be a whole other rabbit trail. <laughs> yeah. All right. Last one you have is ethnic neglect. Yeah. So ethnic neglect that's that's in the category of sins of omission. So it's it's, it's failing to do something, right? Um, so ethnic neglect is when a person fails to care properly for another person because of their ethnicity, um, and so. Yeah, I say that you know in the book that this is a violation of Proverbs three twenty seven, which says, "Do not withhold withhold good from those to whom it is due, when it is in your power to do it." So don't neglect to do good to somebody. Um, and ethnic neglect would, would be neglecting to do good to somebody because of their ethnicity. Um, there, there was uh, one modern example. I, I don't give it in the book, but I. I I read it in um, a great uh, sermon that was given by Francis Grimke. I believe it's called Christianity and Race Prejudice uh, that he gave in the early 1900s. And in that, he gives an example of there were in in the Jim Crow South. There were there there were they were on a on a tr on a train um, and. There was a there was a colored baby who was crying on the on the train, and he, he said that a white woman got up to go and tend to the baby. It was like an instinctive maternal instinct to kind of get up and check and check on the baby. But then when she got to the baby and saw that the baby was black, she like kind of recoiled, turned away, and went back to, went back to her seat. Um, um, and, and he, and he just talked about how, um, you know, the, uh, the race prejudice as he termed it, um, that was so typified in the Jim Crow South had so infected the heart of this woman that her natural, she, she had to go against her natural maternal instincts in order to fall in line with where the culture was at that point. And so that 
Like that was an example of of ethnic neglect. Um, another modern example I give is two of them from the whole Rodney King situation. So Rodney King, 1991, uh, he was uh, the black motorist that was caught on camera being beaten by four white polite police officers. Um, in that story, one, one thing that's not mentioned is that around the, that scene, there were 17 other white police officers who stood there and didn't do anything uh, to intervene while, while Rodney King was being beaten to within inches of his life. And so, so that would be a case of ethnic neglect, right? Failure to, to help someone who's in need, um, presumably on because of their ethnicity. And then connected to that, I talk about Reginald Denny, who in, when, when, when the police officers who assaulted Rodney King were, were eventually acquitted and there were riots in LA, uh, the, during the riots, there was a white truck driver named Reginald Denny, who was pulled out of his truck and was just violently assaulted by a group of black men. And there were other black people who were standing around and doing nothing or even laughing. And those people were guilty of ethnic neglect. Um, and I say in the book, thankfully for Denny, there were four other black people who were there who didn't give into that temptation and they came to his rescue. Um, one famous biblical example would be the parable of the good Samaritan. Mm -hmm. So you have the, the priest and the Levite, they're passing by on the other side of the road for this man who was robbed and, and beaten. Now, if we assume that that man was Jewish, and I, I think we have to based on how, how Jesus delivers the punchline of the story, assuming that he was Jewish, you would have expected that the Samaritan might do the same thing, pass by on the other side of the road when he sees this Jewish person beaten down. Why? Because Jewish and Samaritans, there, were, there was ethnic hostility between those two groups. And so had the Samaritan done what, what, what should, might have been expected of him, he would have been guilty of ethnic neglect. But the surprise of the story is that the Samaritan avoids ethnic neglect by helping him. So, um, and so it's like the Le the, the priest and the Levite, they actually, they like, like they, they actually like, <laughs> it's doubly wrong on their part because like, not only is it an image bearer, it's a fellow Jew and they still just kind of step to the side. Um, but the Samaritan is the one who helps them. And so he avoids the ethnic neglect by helping him. I think that's a really helpful category too, because it's, again, with what we assume about racism, it's, we don't have a category for a sin of omission. Yeah. And so you, you think of, about things like, you know, you know, what you, I don't know when this is going to air, but we're, we're in Thanksgiving and holiday season. Right. And so th this is the time when families come together around the table and the uncle that just, or that grandfather that just be saying wild stuff out of his mouth about other ethnicities. And, and a lot of times, like, we'll, we'll just kind of like be quiet about it, you know, say, oh, that's just uncle. So, and so, oh, that's just grandpa. He, you know, he, he came from a different, a different era, but not like that's like, if we don't say anything, we're actually guilty of like, that's ethnic neglect because that like, we're, we're, we're failing to, to do good. And the good in that case is to speak on, on behalf of those who are being sinned against. Um, uh, and, in our relative speech, you know what I'm saying? And so, um, yeah, it's, it's not, it's not enough to just say, okay, I didn't, I didn't pick up a gun and go shoot a bunch of people of a different ethnicity, but like, like if we, if we fail to intervene when we can, when it's in our power to do so, then, then we're culpable. All right. So let's talk about this. All of these sins that you've just outlined are sins you or I could commit. Which is worth pointing out, I think, because there are definitions of racism which say you can only be racist, you can only act in a way that's racist if you're in power. Yeah. So, so at the end of the day, and and this and this is why I think it's so important to be specific and 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 to identify these things accurately because I don't think there's anybody like who has an, an accurate understanding of their own hearts who would be able to look at that list and not see something like it's something that we've all been guilty of at some point <laughs> you know what i'm saying and so so with that being the case like my my my, my hope is that it would kind of put down some of our defensiveness 
right? Um, and 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 being so quick because again, you throw that you throw that term racism, you throw that label racism was racist on somebody. That's just immediate cause for cancellation, and it's just like it's like it's the scarlet letter of our times. You know what I'm saying? Um, and and so we should be able to recognize that we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And in America, especially where we have this racialized <laughs> society, like like these these things are are in our bloodstreams in certain ways. And um, and you know, he was like just the the subtle in subtle ways, things like ethnic pride. Um, like I've I've seen those things rip my own heart. <laughs> and so I like I have to be mindful like myself to to not like like look down on others. You know what I'm saying on the basis of their ethnicity. And so, um, you know, my my hope, and I say in the book, is that this kind of specificity will will serve us as we like as we dialogue about these things in the church. I think your specificity absolutely is serving us. And I think another, one other thing I want to explore while I've got you is uh, you subdivide all of these categories of sin, but even just framing racism as sin, which it obviously is, no one would object to that. Right. But we don't always think of it in that category. Sometimes we think of it almost like a relic, like, oh, racism, yeah. you know, oh, that we, we dealt with that, but framing it as a sin right shows us that like any other sin it doesn't just go away with time that's right that's right and and really if like if you want to further categorize it it's you know it's the it's the second table of the law right so you, you know what what it, what's the greatest commandment love the lord your god with with all your heart soul mind and strength and then the second is just like it love your neighbor as yourself right and so so ethnic sin would fall under that category of failure to love neighbor as self. And, it, and it's just, it's just within a specific context. Um, and, and who doesn't struggle with that? Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Well, since it is such a universal struggle, why don't we close in praying for ourselves and for those listening that we would be more mindful, more humble, more receptive to correction on this kind of thing. Yeah. So I'm I'm happy to let, let me open and you, you can close and 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 let and let me just say that the at the end of the day it comes back to the gospel it comes back to what the Lord Jesus Christ has accomplished in His life His death and His resurrection on the cross when Jesus suffered the wrath of God among the things that He was suffering for was ethnic sin and the specific ethnic sins of Christians. So th this is not the unpardonable sin. This is not meant to, to cause people to collapse under a weight of, of guilt and self-condemnation. It's a call to appreciate the beauty and the glory of justification by faith alone, apart from works of the law, that God in his kindness and his mercy through faith in Christ has declared sinners, even ethnic sinners to be righteous in the sight of a holy God because of the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so with that as the backdrop, we can go before the Lord, we can petition him, we can acknowledge, we can confess where, uh, where we've sinned in this way, and we can turn to the Lord by his spirit to receive grace and mercy to help us in our time of need. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we bless your name and uh, we praise you. Uh, Lord, we uh, we acknowledge that we, we, I, have sinned and fallen short of your glory, um, that, that the sins of ethnic pride, ethnic favoritism, ethnic neglect, ethnic hatred, um, Lord, like, like th those things are things to which we are not immune. Um, Lord, we need you. And we pray that you would uh, forgive us for in any time and uh, any ways that we may have fallen short uh, in this regard. And Father, I pray, um, I thank you and I praise you that Jesus, the blood of Christ covers all sin, including these. And I pray that you help us to be honest with ourselves and, um, and our brothers and sisters and, uh, in our in our local church communities, particularly 
Um, and I pray that you would help us as as your people um, to um, to love our neighbors as ourselves and to love our brothers and sisters in Christ, uh, which which you tell us is is the new command that that the Lord Jesus gave us to to love one another. And so um, help us to lead the way, um, not to follow the ways of the world, but help us to lead the way in in repentance and in um, in true true unity across ethnic lines that that we as the chosen people of God might better reflect the unity and diversity that's present in your very own character as the triune God. We ask that you would help us to do these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, thank you for this time, for this conversation, for shy and the mind you've given him to be able to clearly delineate these things and help explain them to others. Thank you for uh, the way he's played that role in my life personally in pointing out blind spots. And Lord, I just pray for all of our listeners um, that you will give us friends like that who are able to point out blind spots and lovingly correct, not in ways that condemn, but in ways that point to the redemption we have in Jesus and the ways he is making all of us more like him. And so we just pray that for all of us, that we would more carefully and more carefully obey you uh, and love you and love those made in your image. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. It was a pleasure, Shai. Thanks for coming back. Always. Thank you, brother. <laughs>